to another scholarship highlight brought to you by the Center for Firearms Law at Duke University School of Law. This series is a part of the Center's broader efforts to deepen the scholarly discussion of firearms law by engaging directly with one of the many scholars who are doing important and innovative work in the area. I'm Jake Charles, Executive Director of the Center, and this week we're joined by Akram Pfizer, Professor of Law at the Lincoln Memorial University Duncan School of Law. We're going to be talking with him about his new article, Applying the Privileges and Immunities Clause to Gun Rights, a framework to depolarize the debate and strengthen the federal judiciary, which was just published in the St. Louis University Law Journal. Thanks for being here, Akram. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here. Of course. Um, so first off, just in a nutshell, can you tell us what's the, what's the argument in the article? What's the article about? The, my article is, is pleading for, uh, for compromise and, and bipartisanship and and, 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 and an understanding from both sides of the other side of the gun rights debate in this country. So to give you an idea of my background, I, I'm born in Sri Lanka. I mean, I've immigrated to this country. I'm a naturalized citizen. And so I don't have it within me to have a strong view of guns. I don't own a weapon. I don't have a gun. Um, I don't have a strong view of guns. However, I think liberals tend to view guns as gun the conservative predilection for guns as antiquated and ignorant, and I think that's mistaken. And I think conservatives, I think, believe that every reasonable regulation on gun restriction adumbrates a total prohibition, which I also think is unreasonable. Mm -hmm. And so I think we live in a, in, 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 in a country that today has taken an excessively partisan approach on the, to the gun rights issue, which I think harms national cohesion Problematically for me as a law professor, I think it harms the legitimacy of the federal courts. And I think it, it, it overall, I think, harms our ability to see the issue clairvoyant. Um, so if I can just start off with this, just a little anecdote, right? And so uh, Professor Charles, uh, you and I have taken, of course, during COVID-19, we haven't taken a flight, but typically when we take a flight, right? Uh, we typically call our spouse and say we've arrived safe, right? after our spouse may have dropped us off at the airport. And we all tend to do that. And, but the truth is, if you look at it uh, statistically, right, it's probably our spouse who should call us once we've arrived and said, I've returned home safely from dropping you off at the airport because after all, driving is so much mm -hmm. more dangerous than flying, right? And I think when, when we make, but it's not irrational of us though, to call our spouse and say we arrived safely because that's, there's so many things, cultural things surrounding the fear about flying, uh, the anxiety surrounding airports, et cetera, et cetera. It's not irrational. And I think a similar thing is there with, with Americans who favor broad gun rights. To many people, for example, in the urban bourgeoisie, they may see gun rights or the love of guns as irrational. And of course, they would cite, cite statistics that are in my article and are, were cited in the Heller decision, enunciating that to own a gun means that having that gun, that gun could be improperly used for a suicide or by a home intruder more likely than you defending yourself. But I think that still doesn't delegitimize the deep yearning many Americans have, especially Americans in distressed communities or rural Americans to have some wherewithal to defend themselves. Right? And just like all, all of us, urban, rural, or whatever, tend to call our spouses to say we've let, arrived safely at the airport, I think it, it, we must understand that for many Americans, that gun is a very important aspect of their goal of self-protection and self-defense. Yeah. So one, so one thing I kind of see this article as doing is, is you're trying to say let's let's lower the temperature in the debate over firearms law. Absolutely. Can you tell us um, if that's the goal? What was the motivation for? It? What brought you to write the article? Well, I think one of the things that brought me to write the article is the pronounced polarization on the issue, and my fear that things were happening that could scapegoat individuals uh, improperly for the gun rights, uh, gun violence problem. So one of the things that I, I found very disconcerting was how I think conservative groups that favor broad gun rights were willing to, were, 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 were perhaps with excessive zeal, were willing to claim that the gun misuse problem was attributable solely to the mentally ill, to potentially stigmatize those who are mentally ill even more so. And I think our country has done great things to sort of understand mental illness in the last generation. I think it would be a terrible thing in our polarization around the gun rights issue if 
both liberals and conservatives decided to work together to further stigmatize the mentally ill uh, when they can't arrive at a reasonable approach to gun restrictions per se. And so that's one thing. The second thing is, I mean, I, I, thought, I thought it was a little ridiculous to me. I, I'm not excessively political, but uh, when I see the partisanship surrounding the federal judicial nomination process, that is, I think, completely out of any sense of, 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 of uh, it's completely pathological. First, J J Judge Garland was refused a hearing, but then people started developing massively strong feelings about whether Judge Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, had assaulted a woman. And I was, I've been at conferences where people have, have called Justice Kavanaugh a rapist, a sexual assailant, uh, someone morally unfit for office, right? Based on an incident that happened 35 years before his nomination hearings, and they have no knowledge of anything surrounding that, right? But I, and I think what happens is the dishonesty and the partisanship surrounding how we nominate judges is all informed by things like uh, how the courts have intervened in areas of social policy and social welfare policy and other areas like gun rights to be the ultimate arbiters and preclude, for example, bipartisan compromises. Yeah. So, so who do you see the article as, as in conversation with either scholars or the public and what kind of conversations are you hoping to enter or change with it? I think what I would like people to do is just start a conversation right? Start a conversation and be willing to have a discussion with someone who's not of your same political persuasion. I think that's the ideal scenario, right? Yeah. I, think, I think most conservatives and most liberals are more heterodox than the other political inclination perceives them to be, right? I think most conservatives are more heterodox than liberals think they are and vice versa. And I think ideally we have a conversation on the issue and really look at the issue not from an emotional perspective, the time to have the discussion is not the day after a mass shooting. It's at a moment like right now, right? Yeah. And right now, what's the problem with guns? The problem with guns is unfortunately, tragically, they're being used not for mass shootings, but for suicides, right? And we have a, an epidemic of suicides of young men in this country, many of them veterans using firearms. And so that's one thing I think both conservatives and liberals could agree on that the misuse of firearms to effectuate a suicide is in no way in the national interest. Right? So what can we do about this? So you talk about um, Heller and McDonald in the article and, and kind of what you said just now about how their entry into this debate over gun rights um, either led to more polarization over the issue or at least didn't help the polarization over the issue. And you say that their intervention was necessary. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? What I mean by that is if you look at the Heller facts and the surrounding political culture environment at the time of Heller, Heller was enunciated in 2008, right? And at that time, uh, there seemed to be a gun rights advocates seemed to be in the political ascent. There seemed to be no, there was no movement to dramatically curtail gun possession in this country, mm -hmm. right? And one of the, the hornbook uh, teachings I have in constitutional law is Justice Brandeis from Kentucky, his Ashwander rules from a case called TVA from a v. Ashwander, which dates back to the Great Depression. And in that case, he said something very, very, I think, important, which is, if the court doesn't have to resolve an issue, it mustn't, right? In other words, it should be left to the political process. And another aspect is the court should use its review potentially to protect discrete and insular minorities, that's the footnote four, the, you know, the famous footnote four from Caroline Products dating back to 1938, to protect discrete and insular minorities. But by no manifestation was it the case, by, by, but by no metric could you, have, could you argue that, the, that gun rights were under siege either in the political process or that gun rights advocates were being persecuted in the political process. In fact, by all accounts, gun enthusiasts and gun rights advocates were doing extremely well. But we had, for example, a, a, a compromise on gun rights that was developing that was forcing us to look at questions. You know, what restrictions would we consider, right? Um, to what degree should, for example, former felons have a right to a weapon, right? If, if gun possession or gun, gun, gun ownership is important to self, for self-defense purposes, as the Heller case says, 
by what standard do we deny them to felons? After all, felons most likely, in view of their day-to-day -day lives, former felons probably need a gun more than you or I do, right? And so there are all kinds of problems. And notice those kinds of issues that were never dealt with in Heller. First, Heller intervenes to resolve an issue that needed no resolution, right? And two is, it creates a framework for rights that's both over-inclusive and under-inclusive. Right? It's over-inclusive in the sense that the standard, which is we give constitutional protection to gun ownership for weapons commonly used by the American public, creates a ratchet effect, right? Because if I initially own a weapon like Bruce Willis at Nakatomi Towers, that's one thing, right? But if I raise the ante and purchase AK-47s and M16s, right? Does that may mean those are merit worthy of Second Amendment protection? And the flip side is it doesn't ask the, it, it doesn't adequately address the following question, right? Which is by what standard can we continuously deny weapons potentially in a way that's politically popular if it indeed is a constitutional right to former felons, to the mentally ill, right? And a lot of people, and, and so think of the didactic consequences, right? If you can easily di deny a weapon to someone who's got mental illness, will a man in the American South, by way of example, or in the or in the Mountain West, will they seek mental health treatment if they need it, right? If, I, if, I'm a, if I'm a man living in Idaho or Tennessee where I live, and I may have some depression, will I seek mental health treatment if my fear is the loss of a weapon? These are the kind of things, for example, that judicial review doesn't adequately address, whereas the legislative yeah. process, right, would potentially address. And so I think it was, a, it was the creation of a Second Amendment right that, I think was fortuitously nebulous at the time the court in, improperly intervened. You, you give this analogy to kind of the way that the court intervened in Roe to establish a right to abortion. Um, and, you, and you quote some um, writings by Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg saying that the states had been moving in that direction to a broader right to abortion, just like states have been moving to a broader right to keep and bear arms. And I wonder why, um, why you don't say let's just scrap Heller altogether? Then let's 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 overturn Heller just like there are calls to overturn Roe for that reason. Because I think Heller, in defense of Heller, there was a sizable amount of scholarship evidencing that the Second Amendment right to bear arms um, meant a right to bear arms of some quantum, right? And it's a 2008 decision. I think it would be it would be seen potentially as a little, it, one of my concerns is politicizing the, the bench. My concern is if you try to revisit Heller so soon after it was issued, it's by 2020, 12 years thereafter, it just further politicizes the judiciary. To tell you the truth, I wish Heller was never enunciated, but now that it's there, I think uh, the mistake was to nationalize Heller by way of the McDonald case through the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. I think that's plausibly the mistake, right? Yeah, and so that kind, of, that kind of brings me to my next question, which is really kind of the heart of your article. And um, you say that McDonald went wrong in kind of incorporating the Second Amendment through the Due Process Clause instead of using the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Mm -hmm. And I just want your thoughts on, on, on why that is. Why is the Privileges or Immunities Clause preferable to what the court has done? So my thesis is that the Privileges and Immunities Clause unlike the due process clause form of creating rights, provides both substantive positive and negative rights to American citizens. In other words, I think the, the use of the due process clause to nationalize the Bill of Rights, which is what has happened uh, since basically uh, the early part of the 20th century, has created and basically nationalized the Bill of Rights against states. That may be a merit-worthy proposition, but I think one thing that we might consider is I think that the framers of the 14th Amendment in enacting a provision that said that no state should deny it, uh, any, any, per, any of its citizens the privileges or immunities of citizenship was trying to create a framework to assure every American were ensured basic living standards consistent with an advanced republic. And I think it's more than just the negative rights framework of the Bill of Rights. In other words, it's more than the government saying, you can't do this to people. But I think it, it requires the government to take a holistic approach to try and improve citizen well-being. And I think if we look at it from that perspective, we can look at gun rights differently. 
right? So we have, so on the one hand, guns, if they're overly used or, or if their regulations are too lax, can be the source of grave violence, right? But guns at the same time, especially in distressed times, think of, let's say, African Americans at the end of Reconstruction, right? Who are being forcibly dis disarmed or African Americans who are being subjected to uh, lynchings, right? Um, in that situation, guns can be a protector. Right? And I think what plausibly a privileges or immunities clause would do is rather than have a blanket nationwide re restriction that's not nationally applied, it would potentially empower the courts to take a nuanced look and say, what are the local conditions here before we say gun rights have been violated? Are people, for example, in inner city Chicago, are they feeling safe? Right? Are they feeling safe like the Chicago ones of the Gold Coast? If not, City of Chicago, before you blanketly ban guns, you have to do a little more, like provide police protection, right? And so I, I was at a conference one time and it was it, it, the, the, one of the women I was talking about at the conference was, was, uh, was telling me that she was, uh, they, they were hosting bands from all over the country, high school bands. And it was in Washington, DC. And a few pops went off in the air but the pop sounded to you and me like gunshots. And what she told me was basically every band, band member from all the nationwide bands ran when they heard the shots, right? Because that's the natural, think of let's say the October Bolshevik revolution, all right? And you see the photo of people dispersing. But what she said was the Chicago's, the, the, the largely African-American students from the south side of Chicago, they knew exactly what to do when they hear shots, which is you fall to the ground. And so you had a, a strange situation where the, the, the high school band members from schools nationwide ran, which is what a, someone who has no familiarity with gun violence would do, but the school, but the students from Chicago hit the ground, right? And so that tells you that, 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 that the level of safety provided by state and local government in the city of Chicago was woefully inadequate. And in that situation, in my paper, I say that in many ways, the court got the McDonald result right because what Chicago was doing was completely disregarding the reasonable anxieties felt by Chicagoans brought about by crime and violence that was not being addressed. So what, so if, if that's right, that, um under the privileges or immunities clause and applying a second amendment right in that way, we might get different results in different places. Um, but we wouldn't do that, say, for free speech or free exercise. We think those rights are ones that are properly nationalized. Why do you think the right to keep and bear arms will be different from those kind of rights? If, if you do think that, maybe you think those shouldn't be nationalized either. But if you do think that, what do you think separates the right to keep and bear arms from those other rights? Well, I think, first of all, remember that the First Amendment, our speech rights are, they, they, they in effect are, they are nationalized in terms of rights from the government, but let's face it, there are political culture differences that explain what's considered a, an appropriate and polite thing to say in, in Wyoming versus Manhattan, right? And people react accordingly, don't they, right? Um, and so that's one thing. The second is, I think there is, the reality that weapons can be misused, right? And a weapon is, a, conservatives recognize this by implication when they concede that it has to be the case that a weapon should be denied to a convicted felon. Or they, in fact, advocate, for example, the NRA advocates that weapons be systematically denied to what, who they call lunatics, right? But are all people who have some mental illness lunatics? I think not, right? And so, I think the reality is we have an equivocal relationship with handguns because we all sides, liberals, conservatives, whites, blacks, browns, we all recognize that a handgun can be a source of self-defense, but it also, and it also can be a form of a means of national defense or right militia related defense, but it can also be misused. That's the reality. Yeah. So finally, I, I just want to get your, um, your take then on what would it look like? So you say that the result in, in McDonald was right. Um, and you talked a little bit about why you think that might be the case. Um, but what would it look like if, if courts were going to try to try to enforce this privileges or immunities based 
right to keep our arms. How would they analyze it? Um, what kind of maybe test or framework might they use? And, and how do you think it might shake out? And I didn't really elaborate on that, Jake, in my article. But what, I, what comes to my mind when I think of this is how we implemented school desegregation, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, we empowered the federal district courts to take a searching inquiry of local conditions and the residential living patterns, how kids were, you know, what were the, what were, what were the living patterns within people, whether the school districts were actually being integrated adequately. And we took a look and we looked at it and, and the federal courts did. And over time, perhaps it took too much time. The schools were, right, they were eventually integrated uh, such that you, such that the promise of Brown was fulfilled. I think something could, like similar could be done by applying the Privileges and Immunities Clause to force the courts, giving them jurisdiction to look at local conditions in adjudicating a gun rights claim. So for example, um, a gun rights claim in the city of Chicago would probably be much more favorable to gun ownership because people might say, people would say, the law-abiding citizens of Chicago deserve a means of self-defense because what's the 911 response time, right? Mm -hmm. Cops like to go to distressed communities. Do they like to protect people there? Perhaps no, right? Perhaps insufficiently. But, it, but in a sort of well-kept well part of, uh, you know, the, the research triangle of North Carolina, right? Very likely police protection is quite good. And therefore places like Durham, North Carolina, which is now a tech center and completely different from what it looked like if you watched the movie Bull Durham, right, is now plausibly a, a place that can enact broad gun restrictions, right, to further public safety. But I think it has to, but it requires, I think, the courts to, to take a searching inquiry into local conditions and empower those local courts because the reality is we are a continent sized country with, though we share a, the English language and we share a single currency and we have a unified economy, has great differences in political culture based on region. With that, I can, I can certainly agree. Um, well, this has been a, a fantastic and really interesting discussion. Um, I really appreciate you joining us here today for the talk. Um, and thanks to all of you at home for watching this series um, and all the other talks that we do. Um, thanks, for, thanks for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was a great pleasure and honor. Thank you. Of course.